Good morning. This is different, isn't it? Well, Pastor Craig and I, as you probably have already heard, are out in Denver, Colorado at the Covenant Midwinter Conference. It's the Covenant's Pastors Conference. And just as your worship, I'm sure, has been alive and, and full of vibrance, ours, I'm sure, as well. Would you pray with me? Father, we thank you for this morning. And we pray that as we listen to your word, that we would hear it with our heart and that we might be changed. Pray this in the name of Jesus. Amen. I watched him intently in the mirror. The ritual was always the same. After slapping on some aftershave, he put on a freshly pressed white shirt and unfolded the collar so that it went straight up. He'd fling the long, skinny end of the tie around his neck and make sure that it wasn't twisted anywhere. Then he adjusted the length so that about a third of the short end and the rest, the fatter end, you couldn't really tell in those days because they were almost about the same, same width. I don't know how he could tell. So then the long fatter end was taken over the top and under again. Then putting it through the loop, you could start to see the knot taking shape. By crossing over the top, then through the loop again, except this time from the back, the payoff was imminent. By carefully taking the end through the knot, he gently pulled down on the fabric. Now, by pulling the shorter end that was located in the back and pushing up on the knot, he drew the tie in its full and upright position. The goal of the perfect tie was to have one gentle fold in the middle, not two, not three, one fold. A knot without a fold was not acceptable either. The long end of the tie was to reach the top of the belt, not an inch higher or lower. After attaching the clasp about halfway down, he would put a slight bow in the tie and then put his collar down and make some minor adjustments. Then we would both look into the mirror and admire the finished handiwork. Then it was my turn. I stood at silent attention with my neck outstretched as my dad clipped on my foot-long tie. We looked great. And I knew that one day dad would teach me the art of tying the perfect tie. The day came after spending a frustrating hour and a half trying to figure out the knot all by myself. I thought that I knew what to do because I had watched him hundreds of times. But everything I tried either left the skinny end hanging down by my knees or else the knot looked as, as if it had a, hot, a softball hiding in it. I finally swallowed my adolescent pride and asked Dad for help. He gently took me through the ritual again, step by step by step. Tying a tie is something that every father should have the privilege of teaching. It is a rite of passage, a sign of the coming of age, a life marker for any man who wears a tie. Now that my kids are in their 20s, I've never been more aware of the legacy that we hand off to our kids. It's not only what we teach, it is the spirit in which we teach them. It's not the stuff that we leave them that's important. It is the passion for something good and great. It's our passionate search for God that will make all the difference in their lives. We don't just hand off stuff to our kids. We hand off something far more precious. This story ran in the New York Times, August 13, 2005. 
Marty Scales had a firm grip on the baton Friday as he ran the first leg of the first heat of the men's 4x100 relay. But when he reached out to pass it to his teammate Leonard Scott, a fellow rookie to the world championship, something vital was lost in translation. Scott had his left hand around the baton, but as Marty Scales released the grip to tighten his, the shiny object that the runners call with a mixture of dread and affection, the stick, went clattering to the ground. I put all the blame on myself, a disconsonant Scott said. We can sit up here and say that the stick was slippery or whatever, but the bottom line is that we practice these sticks every day and we're supposed to get through the zone. It slipped out of my hand. I was trying to pull for it and it slipped out of my hand. The running relay is one of the most exciting track field events perhaps in all of sport. Even all those who are at the elite levels where a team like the United States can have, have the four fastest runners in the world, they can still be disqualified because of a simple handoff of a foot-long tube called the baton. But as we know, the passing of the baton is not simple. Things go wrong, even for the best athletes in the world. Each of the runners must be fast, and their timing perfect for the race to go well. No matter how long the race, a 400 meter relay, 800 meter relay, or longer, there is only a 20 meter exchange zone. What's interesting is that the runner who is going to receive the baton in the exchange zone must run away from the very thing that he or she wants to catch. In running away, the runner builds up speed so that at just the right stride in, in the exchange zone, the handoff is made at the fastest possible speed. The Apostle Paul used the metaphor of running the race in a number of his letters. He lifted up the need for disciplined training, stamina, and keeping your eyes on the goal, running with integrity so that you are not disqualified, and finally, finishing well. As you heard in the scripture reading, he told his young protege, Timothy, I have fought the good fight. I have finished the race. I have kept the faith. You get the image in this the, of, of Paul's last preserved letter in the Bible that he was sprinting with all of his might with a baton in his hand and telling Timothy to pick up speed. Take off, Timothy. I'm almost done. It's your turn. Once they entered the exchange zone, the young pastor Timothy needed to be at full speed and then put his hand back and grab the gospel for the next leg of the ministry race. But the exchange zone for such a handoff is very short and Paul knew it. He told Timothy, keep your head in all situations. Endure a hardship. Do the work of an evangelist. Discharge all the duties of your ministry. These are the words of a person who is out of breath and knows that his time to finish his leg of the race is almost over and that all he has left to do is successfully 